The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow or the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me. Good morning, church. I hope you're having a blessed day today. Today we are jumping back into Psalm chapter 48, and I pray you're excited. I'm very excited. We left off last night or yesterday morning, my apologies, going through some amazing truths of Psalm chapter 48, and we ran out of time because what we've been noticing is the Lord has been doing something inside of these daily teachings different than what he used to do before because what we used to do is we used to just open teach and go right through the revelation go right through the topic and just finish the lesson every single time but recently what i've been noticing is a a shift where the lord has really started to bring out additional truth and additional information and a lot of just foundational principles inside of the lesson Now, that is a dynamic shift because that's not something that used to happen like it does right now, which gives us an emphasis and it shows me that we are having new people watching our lessons and we're having people that maybe you've never heard some of the teaching we've done before. All of the teaching we have is what we call stacking. I guess that's a good word. I'm going to start calling it stacking now. But where you get a first part of an understanding, and then you get the next part, then you get the next part. And we started out with the very basics of the word of faith, walking in faith, understanding of grace and faith, salvation, baptism of the Holy Ghost, power, miracles, prayer, just basic understanding. And we say that's basic because that's what it's declared of in Hebrews chapter six, foundation. Then we progressed into the fullness of God. And we spent a lot of time in the fullness of God, love of God, song of Solomon. We got it. We went into the book of Hosea and then we transitioned over into walking in purpose. We spent many, many months on walking in purpose. And from there we transitioned into end time prophecy. So we've done a lot of series and there's a lot of things that I say that I don't have time to re go back through and explain again, because we've taught it before we have almost, Uh, We're getting close to that number. We were almost a thousand sermons on our YouTube channel and on our website right now. A thousand sermons. Now, to be able to explain everything that we know about some of these subjects, we can't go back into again. Otherwise, we'd never get to the lesson. So the Lord has been doing this to where he's been bringing out little truth each day that pertains to the lesson, but it is also what we would call additional information. So if you're wondering why you're starting to see this shift in our teachings, it's because of these new people. When we have vast numbers of new people start to watch and participate in these in these daily teachings, the Lord starts bringing out truth again, and he starts moving on me to share other additional information because those people need it. So... The reason why I say this is just be patient because there's a reason why we're doing this. We're moving as God shows us to move. We've always done that. But I also just want to give a piece of encouragement with that is that if there's things that we're sharing that you want more information on, like prayer, we have a whole series on prayer. If you want more information on Revelation, we have a whole series on Revelation. If you want more information on walking in purpose, you know, we got 100 almost 200 sermons on that but i also encourage you to take our discipleship curriculums discipleship advanced and divine purpose are all being taught this quarter this semester actually but we're teaching all of those right now 
And I encourage you to take those because though we're not going to stop our daily teachings and go back and teach something again, we're going to continue to progress forward in teaching the revelations that we're doing. I, those classes allow you to go back and learn the foundations of stuff. Maybe we taught this stuff almost two years ago and you want to learn more information on it. I encourage you to take those classes. You know, our our BSM discipleship curriculum just finished this week, our lesson on salvation. And that might seem like an easy topic, but if you go back through and watch and listen in our lesson on salvation, it would change your life in the amount of revelation that you could get from the Lord. So I encourage you just to always continue to look forward, but I always encourage you to take those classes because that's where all of the things that we're not going back into, you can learn all of those. That's why we teach those curriculums over and over and over again. Because though I'm not gonna shift and go back into teaching, you can still get those every single semester. And I love it because I love teaching them all. You know, we're teaching end time prophecy in our dailies. We got purpose on Thursday night. We got fullness of God on Tuesday night, and we got basic foundations on Monday night. I mean, we got a, we, we're doing every single subject we've ever taught at the same time. And it's awesome. I'm having a good time with it. Father, bless this teaching in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray that the word becomes spiritual seed sown, producing in our bodies, mind, will, and emotion, transforming us by the renewing of our mind, conforming us to the image of Christ, growing us up in the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, go with me to Psalm 48. We're going to read the passage and then we're going to take some time and we're going to go back through it. Yesterday, we spent the majority of the time on the first eight verses and we didn't finish those. So we're going to finish those really quickly, and then we're going to go into the second part of this psalm, which is really an understanding of God's loving kindness in connection to God's judgments. They're not separate, but they are dynamically connected together. Verse 1, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, in the city of our God, in the mountain of His holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion, on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. God is known in her palaces for a refuge. For lo, the kings were assembled. They passed by together. They saw it, and so they marveled. They were troubled and hasted away. Fear took hold on them there, and pain as of a woman in travail. Thou breakest the ships of Tarshish with an east wind. As we have heard, so have we seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, God will establish it forever. Selah. We have thought of thy loving kindness, O God, in the midst of thy temple. According to thy name, O God, so is thy praise unto the ends of the earth. Thy right hand is full of righteousness. Let Mount Zion rejoice. Let the daughters of Judah be glad because of thy judgments. Walk about Zion and go round about her. Tell the towers thereof. Mark ye well her bulwarks, consider her palaces, that ye may tell it to the generation following. For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. Now, we're going to take some time today and go into this psalm again. Like I said, we spent some time in this psalm yesterday as we started to unpack the understanding of the new Jerusalem and the way Jesus rules and reigns out of Jerusalem in the millennial kingdom. And then after the millennial reign is over, you know, Satan let loose, tempts the people, fire comes down from heaven, consumes them at Gog and Magog, and then enters into the eternity with the Lord, new Jerusalem, new heaven, new earth, and all of those dynamics. I want to say again, like I said yesterday, we don't seem, we don't claim to have a full understanding of all of those different dynamics. There's so many passages you can read, like we read a little part in Isaiah yesterday, Ezekiel, Jeremiah. We haven't even gotten to those chapters yet, so when we get to them, we'll bring out even more understanding. But the reason why I say this is I'm really taking some time today not really to hammer specific details of Jerusalem, New Jerusalem, in the millennial reign, but more giving you an overview of the lesson of the importance of why we study it. So I'm not really hammering some real specific details yesterday and today, 
but more giving you an overview of it, of the fact that it is the city of our God. G Jesus will rule and reign out of Jerusalem. It's the city of God. It's the mountain of his holiness. And we talked about that yesterday, that in Isaiah 2, it's a mountain on the mountains. And it's showing the fact that the topography or the land geographic things will be changed. We know that happens through the judgments of God in the book of the Revelation. But Jerusalem at some point will be elevated. It will rise up to look like a mountain in which the temple will be upon the, the place where Jesus will rule and reign. But also, it's the size of them. It, it's this dynamic occurrence where New Jerusalem and earthly Jerusalem have this connection, even though the New Jerusalem has not actually touched down to the earth yet, because New Jerusalem also has the throne of the Father, which can't touch the earth until after the millennial reign of Christ and after the full judgment of God takes place against the devil. Because when God touches the earth, if there's any type of sin, then you will be utterly consumed and die. That's just how it works. God cannot dwell where there is sin. So it's got to wait until heaven and earth, this heaven, this earth passes away. New heaven, new earth, where there is no sin at all. And the new Jerusalem then descends unto the earth. That is the understanding that we have. I'm going to give myself the right to maybe change that opinion or that understanding later. Uh, but for now, that's the understanding that we have about how this story takes place. But more than just understanding all the specific details, I really want to understand the fact that it's the joy of the whole earth. That's Mount Zion, where Jerusalem is. That's very interesting to me. The fact that at some point in history, when Jesus is here, it's the joy of the whole earth. Because right now, Israel and Jerusalem, Jerusalem specifically, is not the joy of the whole earth. There's a war taking place in that area right now. I mean, there the bombs going into the Gaza Strip and the war that's raging in Israel, that it's not joy. It's very much a source of controversy and all kinds of different dynamics of hate and things of that nature that are taking place. So it's not a joy now, but it will be later. That's powerful. It's a place of refuge. It's definitely not a place of refuge right now. I think that uh, we are in Brazil, but I'm pretty sure America just issued a travel warning to Americans in that region. So, you know, you're not supposed to go there. So it, it's not a place of refuge right now, but it will be. All the things that are that it is not now, it will be later. And that's powerful how quick and how drastic God will change the story. Now, these kings of the earth, they're going to marvel. Well, the kings of the earth before that did not come to Jerusalem to marvel. They came to wage war against Jesus. You know, all the kings of the earth will be gathered around Jerusalem with the Antichrist to try to fight Jesus. Not just fight against God. No, they're fighting against Jesus. And of course, you remember Jesus on a white horse whose name is Faithful and True will come to and come in righteousness to judge and make war, to kill all of them, take them off the face of the earth. But there will come a time when they will marvel. There will be such awe and reverence and fear of the Lord over this. The ships will be broken. War will be over. But the city of the Lord of hosts, that's another reference to Jesus, is the city of our God. God will establish it forever. The city of Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, it will be established forever. I mean, that's, that's such a powerful truth that there is coming a day when the new Jerusalem touches the earth and it will never be gone again. There will never be this time period like it was in the Old Testament where there was Jerusalem. Then they got into, you know, judgment and they had some uh, discipline from the Lord and they got out of the land. There was no more Jerusalem. It was destroyed by Babylon. Then they come back and they go to rebuild. But then later it's destroyed by Rome. And like this back and forth dynamic of there is a city. There's not a city. There will come a point when it will be established and it will never be moved again. It'll be established for all of eternity. That's powerful. That means the way it's established forever is there is no more thou transgression against God. Sin and iniquity and rebellion against the Lord and the God of Israel will be over. 
that's awesome. I, like I said, we're not really hammering out some of the specific details of the New Jerusalem and the millennial reign and, and the, all of that. But some of these overarching premises is just so powerful. The fact that if something will be established forever, that means the thing that keeps having it removed, which is sin and transgression and ungodliness, that's all gone. So hallelujah, I'm excited for that. But we have a thought of thy loving kindness, O God, in the midst of the temple. So when we see it, when we're in this place, we understand his loving kindness. It's according to his name, which means it's of his character. So his praise will go to the ends of the earth. Thy right hand is full of righteousness. So we have a couple main thoughts here. One, we have a thought of. So we think of his loving kindness in the middle of the place in which he's worshiped in Jerusalem. It's according to his name, which means it's an exemplification of his character. His praise goes to the end of the earth and his right hand is full of righteousness. Now we know that a right hand is used in vowing and swearing. Remember in the book of Daniel, the angel rose his right hand and swore by the throne of God that it would go no longer than three and a half years. 1290 days if you add the extra 30 in Daniel that the abomination would take place so you had this vow that is swore by God and it's full of righteousness which means everything God ever said in his covenants and in his promises are coming to fullness and Zion will rejoice the daughters of Jerusalem talking about the nature of Israel will be glad you ready because of thy judgments now this is so important to me we said this yesterday that we've seen this over and over, 45, 46, 47. In every one of these Psalms, we see these two dynamic, drastic things taking place. War. God is a God of war. And the judgments of God in connection with marriage, bride, uh, loving kindness, partnership, that the dynamics of a God who judges and a God who has desire for deep partnership and relationship with his people. They're not separate, but ultimately connected together. The way in which you get millennial reign of Christ and the Jerusalem in which all the kings of the earth bring their gifts and him on his throne into the new Jerusalem where everybody worships the lamb and the father on their thrones where there is no more darkness, and all of these things take place come from the place in which he is a man of war to remove it. And it's these dynamics of thinking on loving kindness. It's actually loving kindness is what is thought of in the temple, the place in which we worship God, connected to, you ready? Judgment. It's his name being manifested where all of the earth praises him because everything he ever said was true according to his covenants because what he vows he will never not do is connected to judgments. And if you walk about it and you're around it and you tell the towers and you consider all of these things, he's a God forever and he's our guide even unto the death. But we tell it unto the generations. Now, this is powerful, and I want to take some time today to really just talk about this. We don't have much time left. But one thing you notice is that from generation to generation, if the information is passed down, then the people walk with the Lord. But you have these times, and it's very often, and it's very common, that what God does in a previous generation is not always passed down and it's not always received by the next generation. God could do a mighty, powerful, miraculous move. Millions of people get saved. Power of God. You know what happened in the 1900s, in the early 1900s, in the, the move of God and Pentecost touching the world. Yet you look at the mid-1900s, 60s and 70s and 80s, and it's like people started to drift away from it. And it did, and it wasn't moving in the power that it was in the in the you know in the 20s and the 30s when Pentecost started to touch the whole earth. Yet then you see the things that happened in the 90s and the word of faith and power and miracles and stiffs and these differences and back and forth between the generations, in which 
if it's not passed down and a lot of times it's not passed down because the next generation doesn't appreciate what God did before. You know, there's a point in history, especially in the Old Testament, and you read this in Judges and even in the Kings, that when a generation sees the deliverance of God and the power and the miracles and the supernatural provision, they are radically faithful to the Lord and praising and worshiping and sacrifice and faithfulness and obedience. And because of that, radical faithfulness you see this peace and prosperity in the land which the next generation participates in they are participating in the fruit of what the generation before sowed but when they participate it's not always appreciated the same because they didn't have to work to earn it the same way and we're not talking about earning the gifts of god but we're talking about the way in which they walked in faithfulness the next generation didn't do that to receive what is being done by the Lord right then. So they don't appreciate it and they start to drift. Now, maybe the next generation gets it, but the generation after that, now you're two generations away from what God did before and his power and his miracles. And you see that all through the Old Testament. You know, maybe the next generation, two or three down the line, they're walking away from the Lord. And then they have turmoil and wars and all those stuff. And then somebody gets the bright idea, let's turn back to God, faithfulness and obedience, and then peace comes back. And then they appreciate it in radical faithfulness and obedience. They rid out idolatry out of the land. And you know, maybe you have one, two, maybe three generations of peace, but then they fall away from the Lord. And it's this back and forth over and over. We serve the Lord, don't serve the Lord. Serve the Lord, don't serve the Lord. It's because what is known of God is not passed down through the generations. It's not told. You have to, God said this very early on after the Exodus, that you have to remind the people, put it before their face and tell the generations after what God has done for you so that they never forget. Because if you let it slip, if you forget, you will eventually not appreciate, you will not value, and you will walk away from it. You saw it all through the Old Testament, but it's even true today. There's a lot of people whose parents or grandparents were radical for the Lord, went to church, paid their tithes, served in the church, was faithful unto God, but then the next generation, they just don't have it. Or the next generation, they're not... They, they don't walk in it. They're far. I, I'm not going to give any personal testimony to this, but there's very few people in my family that are radical for the Lord and faithfulness and obedience and the way in which they serve God. But you look back a couple generations, they were all in. Yet you don't see it passed down. Because when the things were, when the things were tough and, and they needed God, when people knew that they needed God, they were radical for him faithfulness and obedience. Then when it got easy, people started to drift away. There's this phrase that is used in culture today where tough men make good times or you know hard men make peace, but peacetime makes weak men and weak men make hard times and that dynamic of back and forth. But that principle is used all throughout the Bible. And one thing I wanna remind you of is do not get caught up into fables Fables are stories that have morality, quote unquote, morality principles, yet they're disconnected from God. You see that a lot of times. People, are, Oh, I've got this great principle because so-and-so said it. Well, it might be a good principle and actually might have some biblical value. But if it's outside and it does not bring you into a deeper connection with God, then it is not of God. It's a fable and it will actually take you away from the Lord. That's why you see people using biblical principles to gain things. You know, like the, uh, we're going to call it into existence and manifest it. Well, all we're talking about is confession and speaking in faith. Yet because it's disconnected from the God, from God, it's with witchcraft and idolatry fables. It's not of the Lord. I'm getting way off subject. So let's bring it back in as we go to finish. Cause we're almost out of time today. I just want you to see that at the very end of this, do you see the dynamic and the drastic understanding of the new Jerusalem? and the earthly Jerusalem and the millennial reign of Christ and it's a praise into the old earth and it's it's mighty, it's vast, it's drastic, it's beautiful, it's glorious. People come into it for refuge. People bring praises into it. God has established it forever. And then you see this major shift where people say, 
all of this is loving kindness and exemplification of God's character. He's on full display. You ready? In the understanding of his judgments. That God becomes and comes on full display, outright manifest all of himself openly in a context of judgment. You see all of God inside of God's judgments. Yet there's so many people that if I said God's judgments, that doesn't break out in praise in the church. You know, you know, I say prosperity healing. You know, a hundred people jump up and shout and praise and worship God. But I say, God will judge the heathen. And nobody stands up. Nobody shouts. It's quiet. Because for so much, the deception in the church is to separate God's judgments from God's loving kindness. No, loving kindness, his name, a praise in the earth, his righteousness is all in the understanding. Zion rejoices. The daughters of Jerusalem and the nation of Israel rejoices because of his judgments. Because of what he does to remove everything that hinders love. That's what his judgments are all about. God is removing everything that hinders love. He's removing evil. God's not judging the godly. God's judging the ungodly and the sinners, the transgressors. That's what God is judging to remove it so that it will never be that again. So that peace and justice and righteousness and holiness and refuge and praise will be across the face of the old. That's why he's doing it. And it must be considered. You must think on it. This, be, this needs to be something that you think on often. But it needs to be told to the generations. Because this is our guide. This is the blueprint. I love the fact that it says this is our guide at the very end. You want a map on how to remain faithful unto God. You want a map on how to experience all of God. You want a blueprint for how you're supposed to do this life? Let the word of God be a guide. And the way it's a guide is understanding God's plan, God's purposes, what God's going to do on the earth. And you ready? It is understanding his judgments in connection to his loving kindness that will actually be the source of hope. And it will be the blueprint and the path that you can follow in remaining faithful unto the end. They're not separate. They're ultimately connected together. We're out of time today, so we're going to stop here. Please make sure you join us tomorrow. I've got a really special lesson planned for tomorrow during church. But Father, bless these people in Jesus' name. I give you all the glory. Amen and amen. Church, I love you. God bless you. I pray you have a great day. Please make sure you subscribe, like below, drop us a comment, share this with all your friends, and God bless you. We will see you tomorrow. Sparrow's not worried about tomorrow, oh, the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me. The sun's not worried about the winter.